So um, thanks for coming out tonight, especially those of you who aren't um, officially registered in the course yet, but I'm sure you will be soon um, if you're not already. If, um, if you're not registered, you should know that this is a, a tremendous lecture series. It spans the semester. It's Wednesday nights only, and it's at very little cost to you guys. So as Peter just put it, it's the easiest credit you'll ever get. Um, Nancy Fitch, who is the physician who is officially in charge of the course, is not here tonight um, because she's abroad. But she'll be returning before too long. And you guys will love her. She's fabulous. She's practiced medicine all over the world, including directing the Curry Health Center here on campus for years. Um, but uh, couldn't be with us tonight, and so she'll clarify her expectations from you in terms of um, what you have to do for that credit, other than attend the lectures. And Peter Kern, who is a poli-sci professor here on campus, just explained to me that in previous iterations of this class, um, what was required of students was two papers short papers, one, two-page papers, which are essentially opinion pieces explaining um, that you were at two of the lectures and they affected you in this way. You agreed with these points, you disagreed with those. The speaker's uh, argument was compelling in the following ways, et cetera. So that's probably, if I had to guess, the direction that Nancy's going to take it. But if not that, something similarly minimal in terms of effort on your part. So. I really encourage those of you who aren't signed up already to do so. And, um, and the Cyber Bear, um, the course is still available to sign up for, for that credit on Cyber Bear. Oh, there are sign up sheets at the back also for those of you who came in late. So they're, I think they're divided up according to people who are currently registered for the class and community members, et cetera. So those are at the back there. So if you wouldn't mind signing, your name before you leave, that would be excellent. So I'm Kimber McKay, and I'm a medical anthropologist here on campus in the Department of Anthropology. And um, so I'm kicking the semester off, and following me will be a whole bunch of clinicians of different kinds, primarily physicians, but not exclusively physicians, who are going to come in and talk to you about their experiences practicing medicine and being clinicians in other cultures and countries abroad, um, and also other communities or subcultures within this country. So the, the structure of the course, like I explained before, is that it's a speaker series on Wednesday nights, and it gives you an opportunity to come and listen to these clinicians largely um, reflect on their experiences practicing global health. So, I'm a little bit of a standout in this group in the sense that I'm not a clinician and I don't practice medicine myself, um, but I am a medical anthropologist and my um, background in this started when I was a graduate student actually in the mid-1990s when I was doing my dissertation research in northwestern Nepal with a group of people who had no access to modern healthcare whatsoever. They lived completely off the grid and in, uh, in very remote villages in the northwestern Nepalese Himalayas. And um, I was there really on a purely academic or scholarly oriented project where I was trying to understand what would compel people in this cultural setting to marry polyandrously, which means that in that society women have more than one husband at a time. And that's very unusual in human societies. It's unusual across the mam mammals. If you think about it as a mammalian species where reproduction is limited by the female's ability to produce offspring due to the dur duration of gestation and then lactation, you can probably reason through why it makes um, very little sense evolutionarily on the face of it to be polyandrous. So as an evolutionary anthropologist, I was really interested in that question, and that's why I was there, because there are very few human communities that practice this particular kind of marriage. Um, but I was really struck, and I would say maybe even burdened by the reality that I saw around me every day, which was that children were dying of vaccine-preventable diseases, women were dying routinely in childbirth, and that um, the, especially the young and the elderly were suffering um, 
very high rates of um, morbidity and mortality from diseases that would maybe start out kind of small, but then mushroom into things that their immune systems couldn't handle. And sometimes those were diarrheal diseases, and other times they were other things like respiratory conditions, et cetera. And we, those would, um, they would, like I said, start out small, but then they would mushroom into conditions that were sometimes fatal. And it was tough to watch. Um, and it was a really interesting departure from my life here, where I was surrounded by relatively affluent, highly educated people in, in California, where I was in graduate school, where a lot of people were trying to decide whether or not they were going to vaccinate their children at all. And then I was living in this community where people, moms would have given a digit to have access to, to vaccines for their kids to help them avoid some of the, um, the diseases that they routinely suffered from in those communities. There were um, polio cases. Um, there was active leprosy in the community. Almost everybody had tuberculosis. Um, more than 85% of people um, test positive for hepatitis B. And tapeworm is um, virtually 100% uh, in, that, in that community. And you know, you might think, ah, tapeworm, what's the big deal? A little bit of discomfort maybe, but you can get rid of it with worm medication or dewormer but they don't have access to dewormer. So the tapeworm infections that people had there were very severe and would, um, the, the worms would infect parts of their body that you don't necessarily always think about as being infected by worms, like their brains and things like that. So all kinds of conditions that I just thought were, um, it, w it was hard to see people suffering from them. People came to me all the time asking for, you know, if, if I had any medication that they could share with me or whatever, but, or I could share with them. And um, so fast forward a couple of years in a development organization, which at that time was called the ISIS Foundation, um, now rebranded for obvious reasons, <laughs> the um, founder of that group came up to this, um, wanted to come up to this valley and asked me to go with her. We met through a mutual friend who was a physician and um, wanted to work in this very remote place and wanted to develop a, a, a type of development project that was completely founded on evidence and um, best practice in term, from her perspective, w which would rely upon social science research. And so I thought, I had seen all these development projects around me while I, while I was living there fail. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm not sure if I want to get involved in development when I first saw that. And from the villagers perspective, I, um, I had learned that they had a pretty low opinion of development, um, including health development projects. And I can talk about why that is later if you guys are curious. So when this, this group approached me and wanted to enlist me in their, in their efforts, and this is very early stages, they were really just getting off the ground, I thought, gosh, I'm not sure I want to get involved. But I, in the end, I decided it was kind of if, if you can't beat them, join them kind of a situation. They wanted to enrich the work that they were about to embark on with good social science research. And um, so I agreed, and I've been working with that group ever since then. So it's now called the Adara, Adara Development Group, and it's grown enormously. They've spent over um, nearly $8 million in 15 years, well, gosh, I guess 17 years now. And um, we have recently partnered with the UN, and just a week and a half ago, I was speaking at the UN on my work with the group. So it's, it's, it's kind of evolved into this amazing thing. And one of the things that I'd love to encourage you to think about over the course of the semester is how I or any of the other speakers got involved in the line of work that we're in, and how did we get into doing these things that might seem very like very remote possibilities to you guys right now, like almost maybe unreachable. And I, I remember feeling that same way when I was an undergraduate um, and early in graduate school too. I had no idea how I could put it together, where I could wind up doing this kind of work. And I think my um, advice to you guys would be that you just need, really kind of need to be there. So even if you go abroad and do uh, um, an opportunity, find yourself having an opportunity to do some kind of work that might be unpaid um, or very low pay, go ahead and take it. Because if I hadn't been in the, um, 
gosh, I can't even remember, I think I was at a Christmas party or something in Kathmandu and met this physician who was the one that introduced me to these people who wanted to start this development organization. You know, those doors never would have opened, but I had to be there in order, I had to be there living on rice and beans, by the way, <laughs> literally. But um, those doors just don't open generally um, if you don't kind of create those opportunities for them to. So I would, I would, that's my little plug for how do you, <laughs> how do you get into this? And I think it's, um, it has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the history of medical anthropology, which is the kind of work that I do, the chief concerns, and then um, what I have seen to be the, the main clinicians' perspectives on international collaborations that I've um, watched unfold over previous semesters of running um, the course that predated this course that was similar in structure to it, and then seeing the lecture series evolve over time as it became part of the IDS program, et cetera. By the way, how many of you guys are IDS minors? Just one. Any global public health minors? Oh, that's so good. And how about the rest of you? Are you um, pre-med or pharmacy students or what are, what are you? Archaeology. Oh, archaeology. <laughs> how about you guys? Pre-med, yeah. Science. Okay. <laughs> Other poli-sci people in here, maybe? No. Okay, that's good to know. How about you guys at the very back? Community members. Community members, yeah. So medical anthropology sort of formally got its start in the early 60s. So it was in 1963 that we first saw the term emerge. And um, initially, it was based on the idea that there are there were um, what were called medical geographies and topographies that um, characterized the health patterns and disease patterns in different communities around the world, as well as the health-seeking behavior of people in different communities around the world, which is a kind of behavior with a lot of variability, um, a lot more variability than you might imagine if you start looking at it from one culture to the next. Having said that, I also believe have come to believe that a lot of people, including med medical anthropologists, sometimes exotify um, the behavior of people living in what are called medically pluralistic societies. In other words, where people have multiple options to go to. Maybe they'll go to the traditional healer, and maybe they'll go to the spiritualist. They'll also go to the allopathic physician and the pharmacist, et cetera. And so I think a lot of people, especially medical anthropology, they, they, people, even scholars and academics, can, can think of that as something that's like unique to indigenous people or people in the developing world setting or whatever, and I don't think that's true. I think we all do it, and I think every single one of you in this room is a medical pluralist. I think every one of you, for instance, when you get a cold, you do the same thing in essence as people in truly what are called medically pluralistic societies. First of all, you try and probably treat it at home naturally with chicken soup or echinacea or zinc and things like that. And then when that doesn't help, or if it doesn't help, you might ramp it up a notch and go to the pharmacy and get some Sudafed on board or whatever. And then if that doesn't work, you might consider, oh, should I maybe book an appointment? What's the next cheapest option? At least that's how I think. <laughs> My sinus is hurt, or could I have a, maybe I have a tooth infection, or, you know, like anything to avoid actually going to the doctor, which is gonna cost the most. And then I might have to have like an argument over whether or not I'm going to be prescribed antibiotics, <laughs> which ultimately I might like at that point. That's a medically pluralistic um, set of behaviors. And so I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of people think that is unique to, the, to other places around the world, and it's really not. Now, the other um, solid ground that medical anthropology was founded on was medicine, frankly, because early in the development of um, modern biomedical approaches or allopathic um, approaches, the, the, the physicians were essentially ethnographers. In other words, they would live in communities with the patients that they were treating, and they would know those communities inside and out. Um, and they would collect complete histories from their patients, which in a sense was a way of collecting ethnographic information about the household, about the cultural setting that was, um, that characterized the life of the, of the patient afflicted by this disease or that one, et cetera. And so if you look at the writing of early um, 
you know, physicians, especially in England and Western Europe and, and, the Ameri and North America, what you can see is that the writing bears a lot of similarities to ethnography being, that's done by anthropologists today. So that's, the, that's where medical anthropology came from. Its chief concerns I've lifted, listed up there, and maybe you've read them already as I've been talking, but one of them is on the development of systems of medical knowledge and medical care around the world because there are so many different systems. Um, there's, you know, of course, there's Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, Tibetan medicine, there's Quranic medicine, etc. And each of those is a formal setting or a formal system of um, of diagnosing and treating conditions, and they vary tremendously one to the next. The second issue is the relationship between doctors and patients and how different that can look from one culture to the next. The integration of alternative medical systems in culturally diverse environments, the interaction of social environment and biological factors which influence health and illness, both in the individual and the community as a whole. And then the impact of biomedicine and biomedical technologies in non-Western settings. So, so those are some of the chief concerns. And over the years of watching um, the clinicians come in and, and grapple with how to encapsulate the work that they do in, in an hour and change to deliver the lecture to groups like this, these are some of the things that, um, the, the sort of lessons that I've seen them draw. So I wanted to kind of put them on your radar screen, not to give it away. A lot of the speakers are new this semester, but partly just to alert you to some of the themes that you might see emerging, and maybe you can start to look for these themes or um, critiques of them in the words and the, and the messages that you'll hear from the different speakers. So one, um, area that I've seen emerge has been clarifying goals, expectations, and responsibilities is really essential. And um, when people are involved in medical missions abroad, as they're commonly known, um, I think one of the major pitfalls has been that the expectations between the visiting clinicians and the clinicians in residence in the receiving community can be confusing. And so clarifying those as best you can is absolutely critical. Then also um, encourage non-threatening communication because oftentimes there's a power hierarchy which has to be acknowledged and dealt with head on. I remember there was one physician who, um, who I think was an eye doctor, he was talking about the different ways of doing a particular surgical technique that he was trying to teach the, the the young doctors that he was working with somewhere in, I can't remember where, some, I think somewhere in North Africa, is the local physician from here in Missoula. And he was saying how hard it was, maybe it was a heart valve guy. In any case, he was saying how hard it was to encourage these young physicians in these other um, cultures to deviate from the, the one technique that they had been taught by their teacher their mentor, their teacher. They had a really tough time. Like he would show them, he would demonstrate on patient after patient, you can do this procedure A, B, or C way, and they'll all work well, and they'll all turn out with the same result. Maybe, you know, these conditions make you want to choose A, and maybe in this patient you want to go with B, and so that's, you know, maybe why. But they all wanted to do it exactly like their own teacher had taught them and they had a really hard time thinking outside the box, as he put it. And so he was reflecting in his remarks on how um, encouraging them to, to do the procedure, use a different technique, was, was actually threatening in a way that he didn't understand at the time. But then later, like thinking back on it, um, he, he started to think about what it was like to be very junior in that setting and have your teacher there, the senior surgeon there, and be deviating from the thing that he had instructed them on, et cetera. So, you know, that kind of thinking outside the box we do here in this country, you know, with alacrity, that kind of, you know, that kind of independence of thought and creativity and innovation initiative, we love that kind of stuff, right? In our culture, we're very comfortable with that, generally speaking. Where he was practicing, that wasn't true. Um, then uh, another theme was clarifying trainees' level of training and experience um, for the host institution. Selecting trainees was often um, difficult, and promoting the safety of trainees as well. 
monitoring costs and benefits for um, the whole endeavor, but also for um, patient risk um, mitigation from the patient's perspective. Um, establishing effective supervision and mentorship in the in the in the for the period after the visiting physicians were going to leave if they were in a teaching role and then evaluation lacking evaluation of the the efficacy of the medical mission and it it's long term if any impact on the community of physicians or clinicians that they had re reached out to um, so in, in my work, and what I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight was, um, well, a couple of different areas. This picture here is, um, it's a picture of a school hostel that was built at what is essentially a charter school in the, in the valley in Nepal, which, which I'm gonna be talking about next. And it drew students from all over the district and this here is the, um, the latrine block. Um, and this village over here across the valley is the one that I'm gonna focus on in my remarks in a few minutes. But before we get there, I thought I would just describe um, the different kinds of things we're researching in my research group right now, just to see um, if you might be interested in learning more about that, feel free to contact me afterwards, or um, maybe this would pique your interest in pursuing medical anthropology as a career. So one thing is that we, as you probably know from what I've said already, is we're interested in health patterns and disease patterns and also health-seeking behavior in remote small-scale communities. So I work in, I've worked for almost 20 years in um, central Uganda, as well as in Nepal, and my graduate students and undergraduate students alike have spent time in both places. Um, the Ugandan setting is very, very different from Nepal. Um, they have a load of um, parasitic and sort of equatorial tropical diseases that they don't, don't tend to suffer from in the arid high conditions of the Himalayas. They also don't have mosquito-borne disease in the, in the Himalayas like they do in Uganda, but in many ways it's similar as well. Um, we also look at power inequalities um, and their impact on healthcare and healthcare delivery, insurgencies, disasters, and health, um, and the relationship between those things as well. So over the course of time that I've worked on this in Nepal, um, Nepal underwent uh, a violent revolution which, um, during which the health infrastructure was um, destroyed by the revolutionaries. And so that had an enormous impact on healthcare delivery in places like, um, like where I work. Last spring, as I'm sure you guys know, the, um, on April 27th, Nepal had its massive earthquake, so that um, had very, you know, obviously catastrophic impacts on people in the communities around central and north central Nepal where the, um, the damage was the greatest. We also look at food security and health, and we've um, studied this in, in some depth in my graduate group because um, in this district of Nepal, it, it um, there haven't been roads until very recently. So it was just pedestrian traffic only. And to get from the airstrip that you fly into into the um, villages that I work in, you have to walk between one and five days. That's eight hour days walking. So it's out there and it's hard to get to and it's hard to get supplies and equipment and stuff like that in. So it starts to give you a sense of why it might be difficult to deliver healthcare in a setting like that. There's no electricity, there's no cold chain for vaccines or medications that need refrigeration, and um, it's just hard to get around. Well, that all changed a couple of years ago because a road was built into the district from China, of all things. They have permitted, I don't know how they negotiated this with the Nepalese government, but there's a road coming in from the north with a terminus sort of partway through the district. You can't access it from the road system on the Nepal side. You can only drive in from the China side. So. Um, along that road are, um, is a new flow of goods and commodities and, unfortunately, um, diseases and um, alcohol and other things like that. Which, uh, and also among those commodities are relatively low um, nutritional value foods, which people think are fabulous, which um, I used to think, you know, I used to think, like, I would be sort of, like, scandalized, like, oh, you know, isn't it? 
sad that the villagers are switching over from the super grains, the proteinaceous grains like amaranth and buckwheat and millet and all these wonderful things that they've traditionally grown and eaten as staples in their diet. Now they're eating like Coke and ramen noodles <laughs> and stuff like that. And it's particularly my grad students been studying in the communities around the road who's, who's switching over to this new diet. And it's especially children and elderly people and men. Well, men's diet have, has changed a lot. They, they're drinking a lot more alcohol than they used to. So, so we were sort of hand wringing over this and isn't it, you know, it's such a shame, things like that. And then I took my kids to Nepal with me for the first time. Like I almost always, I've always gone alone. There's just so many, you know, diseases and things like that, that it would be easy, it's, it's very easy for young children whose hands are in their mouth all the time to pick up that I just have always left them home. So I broke with tradition and took the kids over. And um, to keep them safe from getting diarrhea, diarrheal diseases from you know, un, you know, wa unwashed or poorly washed foods or whatever, I resorted to feeding them Coke and ramen noodles. <laughs> so I was laughing at myself of how quickly I made that transition myself. And Coke and ramen noodles taste delicious to children. They love that. So they were all about it. And so I, I, I stopped um, you know, ha with any kind of editorializing about my village friends who were <laughs> giving their kids ramen noodle and Coke because I finally understood. So we've also been looking at exogenous forces of change. Like there's a lot of um, climate change impacts in this part of the world. Um, the rainfall and snowfall is unpredictable, and when it comes, it's catastrophic usually. It's like a massive, massive blizzard or nothing, or massive rainstorms that erode all their fields or nothing. And so seasonal streams that they've relied upon for a really long time have dried up or are available at times that they didn't used to be available and not available when they should be available and all these kinds of things. And so that's affecting things like irrigation and crops that they've grown with um, confidence for generations. You know, these, these grain crops that I mentioned before are now suffering from fungi and pests that they are unfamiliar with and um, don't know how to combat. So there's some interesting food security problems associated with both the combination of the, this arrival of this road and these co-synchronous um, climate changes. So anyways, that's, um, that's a quick and dirty on our research group. If, if anybody's interested, you can always contact me by email. So the primary objective of my group is to identify the key socioeconomic and infrastructural determinants that influence the effective delivery of health and education services in these settings, because education and health are intimately related, which is the subject of a whole other class. But as in, in a nutshell, as literacy increases, health outcomes improve. Um, as literacy increases, especially in women, their marital power vis-a-vis -vis their husband generally improves, and their ability to access modern co contraception and space their births the way they want them spaced improves. And the knock-on effects of, that, the, of those things in combination in terms of health outcomes are, especially for women, very powerful. So we always um, are interested in studying health and education together. So the conceptual framework in terms of the, the research direction that I've done with the development group, and my grad students have been involved to a lesser degree with this, and my undergrad RAs to a, a very significant degree because they help me with the data entry and um, early stage analyses. But we do baseline and impact surveys with structured questions around key target areas. And so those baseline surveys happen in the community before the development group starts working in those communities to give ourselves some sense of things like what we call, it's typically called a CAP study, knowledge, attitudes, and practice around specific things, typically health and health-seeking behavior, as well as development priorities and development technologies and innovations. <clears throat> this allows, <clears throat> excuse me, villagers and stakeholders' voices to be heard and that's from everyone. In other words, a lot of development organizations will go in <clears throat> and they'll do some group chats, which is awesome. I would never knock a development organization for organizing a group conversation with a collection of villagers that are supposed to be the end users or the beneficiaries. But the problem is that 
As you guys well know from sitting in classes, when your professor asks you to talk, not everybody talks. Shy people don't talk. Introverted people don't talk. People who don't feel good that day don't talk. Unpopular people don't talk. People who, or people who think they're unpopular, or people who are on, on the edges don't talk. And it's, it's true in all of my classes, or people who perceive themselves to be on the edges, even if they're not. It's true in these communities. So we um, have departed from what's a, a very comfortable method in the development world of just doing conversations in a group setting like they have, might have a few, it's very typical in development organization, have a few one-off conversations in group chats and then say, well, we talk with the villagers, we got their opinions, we understand what it is that they want now. But the problem is it's so flawed methodologically um, to think that you got a good representation. In this case, in these villages, we, you have people of different caste positions. Women typically don't talk um, in front of certain community members. The very low caste people don't talk. They wouldn't even show up, um, et cetera. So you cannot say that you adequately got representation um, or representative views. So we do 100% 100% household coverage in every village that we work in. And the teams, when I say we, the teams are all local people. So I think a lot of social science researchers would go, no way, they're not getting 100% coverage. Because, you know, there's always going to be some curmudgeons or people who don't want to talk. You know, they don't want to play ball. But the local people who work for the organization are very adept at and, and persuasive, and, um, and they're very sensitive, and they're all trained in cultural sensitization of communities who are um, engaging with development organizations. So they um, do actually achieve to have you know, these conversations with everyone in the community, or at least members of every household in the community. The communication of findings within our team and then to the broader community is also really important. In fact, it's in the ethical code of the American Anthropological Association and many other disciplinary um, associations. You have to communicate what you find out through publications, public speaking, going to conferences and things like that. So that's why your professors sometimes disappear mid-semester and go to conferences and such. Um, theoretically speaking, in, in our group and you know within um, the development organization that's sort of been talking about tonight that I really co-founded and helped build, there's been an emphasis um, on understanding things from CMA, which is critical medical anthropology. So being critical of <clears throat> why it is that, or thinking critically about why it is that not everybody's accessing healthcare equally, um, what it's like um, from a patient perspective to um, walk for several days to the health post and then be treated badly um, as a country bumpkin by the elite physician who's from a city who is stationed there and, um, and so on and so forth. So thinking, thinking through those interactions critically and trying to understand them in their political and economic context to help us understand why it would be that a pregnant woman wouldn't seek antenatal care. I mean, to us, it's so intuitive. Like, if you're pregnant, you should probably see a physician. You should probably have your pregnancy monitored. It's like the germ theory of disease in our culture. We just take it as a matter of course that pregnant people should generally probably be seen once or twice, at a minimum, by a physician. There, not so much, and especially in the Ugandan setting. So why is that? So thinking critically about why that might be the case, and not criticizing people for it, but understanding and showing them compassion has been um, informed by this critical medical anthropology theoretical perspective. Medical ecology refers to understanding the, the sort of socio-ecology of the community itself and why it is that people in that community um, seek medical care in this way or that way. So that's what we mean by medical ecology. And then fundamentally, the, the basic, um, the bottom rung there is ethics values and social justice being what's motivated. I think not just us in the development group that I work with, but across the industry of development organizations and, and global public health. I, I think it would be a stretch to find one speaker in this speaker series or in, in the broader community of people practicing global public health who don't believe very powerfully, very strongly in the idea that, um, that health is a, is a human right and that people 
no matter what their circumstances are, should have access to health care. So questions in doing the kind of work that we engage in in medical anthropology would be th things like getting complete clarity on who are we aiming to help in, in any particular project. Um, and how do those people perceive assistance? Because they might not ta take up the innovations that you're introducing to them. Be those innovations technological ones, like, I don't know, um, associated with cold chain or vaccines, or behavioral innovations, like changing your behavior completely, w changing your toileting behavior completely, for instance. That can have, um, that can seem very novel to people who don't use modern plumbing or even latrines. Um, and then studying and asking questions around how do community adaptive practices evolve over time. So in these pictures, just as, a, as, as, a, as an explanation, this is a community conversation in one village where um, <clears throat> these, okay, so this village here at the top is called Lama Kolshi, and this village down here is called Kolshi, and I'm going to talk about Kolshi in a minute. They used to draw their water from the same source, and they used to have equal rates of disability. And now the people in Lama Kolshi, Kolshi have relatively low rates of disability. So we're having this community conversation about these people and what they think about disability, and I'll talk to you about what kind of disability I'm referring to in a sec. And so what they think about disability and what their own explanations are for why it is that um, the one, they all used to have a lot of disability in their community and now one community doesn't. And they, they believed it had a lot to do with their water supply. So this is a big water tank. This is me and my co colleague Prahlad and some villagers from there. And they had just built this big cin um, cistern, is that a word? And they were going to um, store the water in it, and they were going to—they were hoping to treat it and do some other things that were um, that they were thinking was going to reduce the disability in their community. So I'll talk about that. Probably doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense, but I'll talk about it in a sec. And this lady right here, she's a Ugandan traditional healer, and she's in a big. She's actually lecturing. You can't see in front of her. She's got a big audience of traditional healers from all over the country, and she's lecturing them on why they need to. Um, organize as a group of practitioners and systematize what it is that they do with their herbal medicines. It's a fascinating thing where they were trying to figure out like what are the actual biomedical properties of these plants that we use and we need to like systematize it so that we know that we're all giving like the same amount to the body weight of um, you know titrated by body weight so that they could um, interact more effectively with allopathic physicians because the the, from the Western doctor's allopathic physician's perspective, it was really the last thing that they wanted to hear when a patient came in emergent setting and revealed that they had some traditional medicines on board because they didn't know what kind they were, what was, they, the patient didn't know the herbal name, they didn't know what its biomedical properties were, they didn't know how much they ingested, and they didn't, the physicians would have a hard time understanding how those things might interact with the drugs they were about to give them. So, um, so they didn't. The, the Ugandan doctors really, I think, are, are going to benefit enormously from activities like these traditional healers getting together. Perfect world. Um, so, oh, I'm going to skip. This is kind of boring stuff. This is just a schematic that I made to. <laughs> Looks really fancy, huh? I spent a long time on that. But now I'm going to skip right over it because I'm like losing my voice up here. OK. Um, so this is Nepal from, this is Google Earth. And um, here's where we are. Oh, see, I've marked the UN road. Can you guys see that? That's pretty big, huh? So the UN road is that road that's coming in. And I marked it with that blue thing just to orient you to where we were talking about. So here's Kathmandu way over here. Um, Everest is up over here just to give you a sense of where we're talking about. So to get in here, you um, fly from Kathmandu to this town over here called uh, Nepal Ganj, which is on the Gangetic Plain of the River Ganges. Very low, malarial, hot, not nice. I don't like it. Whoa. And then um, you take another flight up here, which is about 45 minutes. And I really don't like that because the pilots um, fly by sight, they don't use instruments, and 
they, the only instrument they have is like a little, like a handheld GPS, which they put on the dashboard of the plane, which is disconcerting to say the least when you're in a big cloud bank and you know they can't, they have nothing but what they're seeing out the windshield and you don't know what's on the other side of the cloud bank, like maybe a mountain. So, um, so that's my least favorite part of the trip. Um, and so this is a close up of, um, of the valley. And so here's Simicote, the place that you fly into and then you walk. And um, this is the Karnali River. And the UN Road has just kind of peeked into the district um, uh, when this picture was, um, or when this satellite image was done. And now it's extended down the valley considerably. And I heard from my grad student who was just up there that it's like, oh, it's like almost down to here now which is astonishing. I can hardly believe it. But I think road is like road. I think it's actually a wide path. <laughs> and um, so it's going to be a while till it's actually a road. OK, so as an example of, of kind of what I'm talking about here, I thought it would, oh my gosh, 723. Um, thyroid disease, OK? So thyroid disease is very common in the Himalayas. And it usually manifests um, most obviously with um, goiter. So goiter is a really um, <clears throat> early stage, um, relatively early stage uh, manifestation of thyroid disease, which is oftentimes triggered by iodine deficiency. So we almost never see this in our country because our salt is iodized. Um, and in many countries around the world, salt is iodized. In Nepal, salt is iodized. But these people prefer the salt that is gathered around the perimeter of these saline lakes up on the Tibetan plateau. They think it tastes better than the iodized salt. And so they will always, um, they're very tricky. They'll, they'll, they'll say that they use the iodized salt. But then when you're hanging out in the kitchen, you can see they're reaching for their Tibetan salt because it, it, it does have a, a special flavor. So you still see um, that as a, as a potential reason behind the thyroid disease in this community. So in one community, in this Kolshi village, there are very high rates of disability. So there's, um, it's not just thyroid disease, and it's, just not, it's not just goiter, but also there are a lot of people who are um, suffering from um, what's called cretinism um, and who are suffering from uh, med uh, mental retardation um, and other problems which um, they were born with. And it's not clear why. So this is looking across the valley. This is just a kind of a um, zoomed in Google Earth. So this is Lama Kolshi, that picture I showed you before, where they don't have high rates of disability but used to. And that's Kolshi there. And the previous picture of those people looking a little bit down and out, and the lady with the goiter were taken in Kolshi. So this, this river right here is this little um, side river to the Karnali down here, is the one that they used to both draw their water from. And so they believe, they believe very firmly, the villagers in both villages, is something about this river which is causing them to have disability. Um, so it, Cretinism is potentially caused by uh, advanced thyroid disease. Um, and <clears throat> advanced thyroid disease is also characterized by mental deficiency, deaf mutism, um, squint, disorders of stance and gait, and stunted growth. So um, this is a, a condition that has plagued um, the human species for a very, very long time. And it has been traditionally believed to be the result of a restricted diet, isolation and intermarriage, as well as low iodine content in foods. Um, and early on, physicians, these uh, sort of medical ethnographers, <laughs> noticed that children often had peculiarly stunted bodies and retarded mental faculties conditions um, later known to be associated with thyroid deficiency. So in the, in the you know, a long, long time ago, and when um, earliest physicians started writing about this condition, they didn't understand the connection with the thyroid. So the research question that we were exploring was what factors are contributing to the high rate of disability in some of our villages? And so we were looking at it from three angles. We wanted to understand what was the role of soil and mineral-based deficiencies, because there was a potential that there was some 
characteristic of the water and soil, according to the villagers, that was relevant. We also wanted to understand what was the role of intermarriage because some of the um, mental retardation and low stature, um, low adult height achievements um, could have been associated with uh, other problems in that community that we were seeing. Um, there are um, skin disorders, albinism, and things like that, which are typically associated with high rate of intermarriage or in marriage. Um, and last, we were trying to understand how people perceive and cope with disability and what services they need. So you could see how medical anthropology perspective would be very useful in trying to understand this based on what I've told you so far. Like a purely biomedical perspective might leave out some things of relevance to these people in this community as they struggle to deal with the um, diseases that they, particularly disability-linked diseases that they're struggling with, but also interact with Western physicians who are trying to help them um, from their particular perspective. So um, I'll breeze through this last bit and, um, and then close for questions. So one of the things that I had one of my graduate students do a couple years ago is look at the rate of intermarriage, of in marriage, sorry, versus out marriage. So endogamy versus exogamy, which is what we call it in the anthropology world. Um, and we compared it um, between, this is, she um, gave these villages pseudonyms in this figure just because she was publishing this. But um, this is the village with the disability. And this is the village across the valley that I took that picture from. This is the school that I um, noted in that earlier picture. And they had very low rates of disability. And so one of the things that we wanted to understand was how, inter, how in, in married this other village was. And what we, you can't really see it. So these, all these lines indicate relationships by marriage between households. And it's, you know, just to eyeball it, it, it um, probably looks to you like um, this village has an awful lot of outmarriage happening, as you can, as indicated with all these lines that extend from outside the, merit, uh, the village into the village. Whereas this village has a lot of lines from one household to another household within the village. And so she statistically analyzed this, and indeed, their connection was reasonably robust and statistically significant. They were in marrying within the community at a very high rate compared to the other one. So there was definitely something going on with that. We tried to um, collect soil and water to do this, the testing and compare with soil and water from other villages with less disability. But we were foiled in our attempt to do that because the villagers were so concerned. Um, they, have, they are practicing a combination of Hinduism and Buddhism and animism. And they were concerned that the deities and spirits that live in the soil and in the water will be offended by having it taken outside, for, oh, from away from that place, that they wouldn't let us do it. And um, I suppose if we worked on them more and more over the years, they may, may change their view on that. But at the time that we did the study, it was so deeply offensive and worrisome to people that um, ultimately decided against it. I mean, how could you violate? You know, they were expressly telling us not to do it. So that um, hypothesis ended up not being tested. And you might think it, you know, it's like, well, surely you can talk them out of it. But I'll tell you a quick story, which is in a neighboring village where I collected data during the time I was doing my dissertation research, the neighbors or the villagers were very, very hostile to me, and I could never figure out why they were so mean to me. And I thought, I must have really stuck my foot in it at some point in time, or how I've offended these people somehow, um, because they were so unkind to me when I went to um, hang out there and interact with villagers and stuff like that. So one time I, I think we'd been drinking barley beer and we kind of let loose and started talking and I asked them, why, what's the rub here? And they said, okay, in 1973 when your professor, Nancy, um, did her research in this district, which my, prof one of the, uh, outside members of my dissertation committee was um, at UCLA at the time, Nancy Levine, fabulous person and wonderful anthropologist, had lived in this village 20 years prior. When she left, the honeybees left at that same time. So imagine living in a place where you have no sugar in your diet, you have no sweet in your diet except for honey, and how 
disappointing that would be. So they had no honey for years because their honeybees left, which they associated with Nancy's departure from the village. So along comes this you know, <laughs> next generation of um, anthropology researchers wanting to live in their village, and they really weren't that interested. <laughs> so you can see that, and they were um, completely convinced that this was the reason that this had happened with their honeybees. Similarly, they were completely sure that if the soil and water samples left with us, that something bad was going to happen. And um, you have to respect that. It's their soil, it's their water, it's their village. So um, themes. OK, I've gone over the major concerns and a couple of theoretical perspectives, medical anthropology, and talked a little bit about crossover areas with the international medical mission industry. Um, I get kind of presaged the major um, themes from the clinician's perspective. And a couple things that I thought you might want to look for in terms of best practice when you listen to the physicians and clinicians of different kinds, because they're not all doctors. Um, that you're going to hear from. So um, how people talk about the mission. Is it carefully articulated? Is it humble? Is the um, mission shared between the, do they, are they able to talk about how they shared a, a, a common mission with the people on the receiving end of their, um, of their work? Um, collaboration, how collaboratively were the projects developed and executed? Um, a lot of people will talk about education and how the experience was more educational for themselves in the, at the end of the day than it was for the people that they went to educate. So that's an interesting thing to look for. And there's a constant theme of service. Um, I think in the, in the aid industry, the development industry that I work with, service as a word is commonly associated with um, people coming from a more religious persuasion, so people tend to talk about, you know, engaging in service for I serve, that, you know, that language is very common, but you'll hear it, in fact, across, um, I think, the, the speakers that you'll hear in this series, no matter what their motivation was. Maybe they were religious, maybe they weren't. Um, it's interesting to listen to the, to the different um, precepts, I think, come out in the words that people use. Teamwork, also sustainability, um, and evaluation. I think that is the last one. Yes. Um, so I'll stop there. If there are any questions, I'm very happy to take them. And um, thank you for listening. I know this class meets late in the day. So with the two villages, um, you had said that like, they both thought that it was coming from the water. Mm -hmm. Had the one village started getting the water from somewhere else, and like, that's why they thought that it was in that river? Yeah. So the government had come in and, and tapped a spring way up on the ridge behind the village, and then they tapped it into a tap stand. Okay. And so they were, I mean, who knows why? Might have had nothing to do with the water. But in their minds, that was like a departure point that marked the end of an era. And so that was, that was for them, very compelling um, as an explanation. No, there isn't pushback. Um, you know, it's it's very com it's a very common question to ask people. You know, where are you from, and where is your wife from, and that kind of thing. So that's very familiar and comfortable to people. It does take a long time, and that to collect those data. I mean, that was a PhD student in in our program who is now um, graduated and um, finished, but she lived there for over a year, and so it all. I mean. It was, you know, hundreds of hours of interviews of all kinds of questions. So I, if you just distilled those questions out, I'm not sure what it would add up to. But yeah, it, and it is, um, you know, like anything, it's delicate. Like how you phrase it, you can phrase it appropriately or offensively, of course, like with anything. But, um, but generally speaking, people don't feel discomfort talking about that particular topic because they, um, especially you know, in the, in the course of uncovering, you know, who lives in this house and when do they live here and are, are they sometimes absent for part of the year because they're with the yaks up at the yak camp or 
maybe they travel for work or whatever. Um, it all just kind of those details come out very organically. Yeah. The one kind of rub, I think, that the awkward piece was if um, bef in the community that I lived with, which was ethnic Tibetan people, these people with a disability are not Tibetan. Their first language is Nepali, and they're caste observing Hindu Nepali people. The folks that I live with further up the trail were Tibetan Buddhists. And they were very well aware that polyandry as a marriage system was maybe seen as a little bit uncivilized or whatnot or frowned upon at a minimum. And so sometimes people would be kind of like, you know, not totally sure they wanted to talk about that initially. But, um, but at, over, you know, years of going in and out of that community, then people don't, you know, it's different. It, it cha has changed a lot over time. Kimber, I think your, your last slide was particularly telling in terms of this lecture series. I, I really like the points you made there for themes that you should look for from the people, really amazing group of people that are going to be talking to you over the next several weeks. Um, one of them, you talked about self-education, and I particularly like that one, and what, I like it in this sense. I like to ask people who have been abroad doing some of these really amazing things, what did you bring home that you can use here in Montana from the experiences that you've had overseas? Um, and sometimes they've thought about this, and sometimes they haven't thought about it until you ask the question. But they all usually give you some kind of an interesting answer. Because I really like this idea of reverse innovation, that there are things we can learn from people in other parts of the world, even people who are relatively uneducated, that they can teach us. Um, so let me ask you that question to start off. What thing did you learn that you brought back with you from your experiences in Nepal or Uganda that you felt uh, you could share with others once you got back here in Montana? Uh, you know, I'm sure there were many, but what, what stands out in your mind? <clears throat> well, I, I actually did that TED Talk on this topic on polyandry, and I, I, w when I went there um, to Nepal, I you know, I was 23 years old or whatever I was at the time, and I think I had a pretty narrow definition of what marriage should be. And, I mean, academically, scholarly, I totally understood that, you know, there's cultural variability and it is what it is, and of course I went without judgment. Um, but just seeing people living in all these different kinds of marriage configurations was very eye-opening, and the the lack of judgment of people because like sometimes, you know, a lot of people would start out polyandrously, so women would have, my best friend had five husbands when she started out her marriage. Then she kind of gradually whittled it down until she only had one, the, her favorite one. Um, and that kind of variation over the course of an individual's lifetime and variation within a community because people are, are at different phases of their marital career, if you will, was met with no judgment. It was just, it was what it was. And people, that family had two husbands, that one had three. That guy over there had two wives because he married two sisters. Nobody cared. I mean, was there an ideal? Yeah, there was definitely an ideal. And that ideal was actually polyandry because this is a really interesting subsistence system where they trade. They do the long distance pedestrian trade. They herd these big herds, traditionally of yaks and horses. And then they grow food. They're agriculturalists. They're pastoral, agro-pastoralists. That's their subsistence system's name. So in a perfect household, like the cultural ideal, there would be three husbands. One would be in charge of trade. The other one would do agriculture. And the third would take care of um, herding, you know, guarding the herd when they were up in the, where the snow leopards and the bears are, literally. They had to protect the, I mean, you know, they're herders. So it was interesting. I mean, that was the ideal. I mean, the ideal family, because then you ha would have, an, in a relatively hard ecosystem to bring home the bacon, as it were, you would have multiple guys pitching in, 
supporting one woman and one woman and her children. And those were the households that people kind of looked up to and almost sort of put on a pedestal. It's like they were reaching the cultural ideal and they were doing really well. And what did it mean to do really well? They, in real life, they had more surviving children. Their children were healthier. They were, um, because they had more surviving children, they had more kids available, especially male kids available that they could send one to the monastery to become a monk. So they kind of had it all <laughs> sorted out in terms of their relationship with religion. And they also, because they had their relationship, the ratio of dependents to providers was very good. So they had abundant resources that they could tithe to the monastery and be seen to be supporting the monastic community, which generally doesn't do a lot of agriculture and things like that. They're busy in the monastery, right? But who, who's going to feed them? So the villagers do. They, they sort of pay taxes or tithe using their extra food. So that was the ideal. And I just thought that was, you know, it was fine. And so did everybody else. But if you didn't reach the ideal, because like maybe you only had one, one son, so how could he be polyandrous? Oh, because I forgot to mention, the brother, the husbands, the co-husbands are each other's brothers. So a woman would marry a set of brothers. Okay. So if there was only one brother, then he would naturally be monogamous. And nobody cared. And I just thought that was really beautiful. And I thought that, you know, our culture is really struggling with, um, with understanding definitions of marriage. And that was basically the gist of my TED Talk. I mean, the intimidating thing about doing a TED Talk is it goes online and then every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world can comment on it, you know, like until kingdom come. And so some people have commented things like, oh, she sounds like she's advocating for polygyny. I wonder, you know, and then some people pr contact me privately through Facebook or whatever. And like, are you saying that you're like advocating for polygyny, you know, like women having, men having multiple wives in this society? And I wasn't really advocating for that per se as being more open-minded, generally speaking, about how marriages should look. And we, we're sort of handed a template in our culture and thought, you know, we're taught, like, if you don't conform to the template, then maybe you've somehow failed. Or you can't be as happy as you maybe could have been, or whatever. And I think living there just made me realize there are a lot of ways to skin that cat. And I felt like, as a culture, we could really probably learn from that. That was what my TED Talk was about. It was like an extended metaphor for marriage equality. <laughs> it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with Mormons or polygyny <laughs> or that kind of thing. So. Yes. So is this style of uh, marriage, that's a very traditional, long-standing uh, means of maintaining families, is that correct? It is. And is it driven primarily <clears throat> by the harsh economic conditions of that environment? You know, that is a, it's a very interesting question that nobody has the answer to. Um, the, this valley is on the southern edge of the Tibetan diaspora. So all across the Tibetan plateau at one point in time were little enclaves of populations of Tibetan people who practiced polyandry. That, we know that from historical documents and you know, from knowing the history. So the question is, how did it ever evolve in that, in that particular culture and you know, population? And the thinking is that in those communities where there were big monasteries to support, that the, the taxation, it was not voluntary tithing, it was taxation imposed by the monasteries on the communities around them, and that polyandry was a very effective way to manage the dependency ratio in a household in, in, in such a way so there would be a surplus produced, particularly of grain. So, Polyandry does achieve that end. Um, the other thing that it achieves is it keeps the birth rate for the community down because relatively few women are drawn up into marriage and there's very little re reproduction outside marriage. So it excludes a lot of women from marriage and those women typically would have become nuns in the nunneries um, and, and would not have reproduced. So 
In the Tibetan Plateau, the average elevation is 15,000 feet. So in those villages, it's very arid, there's very little arable land. It's tough to grow food and feed yourself and support a large dependent community of monastics. Um, and so that all, I think, worked very well. In this ecosystem, it also works very well because it's a tough way, it's a tough place to make a living. But just down the trail are these ethnic, um, are these um, Hindu practicing, caste observing, Nepali speaking people. They don't practice polyandry, but they're basically living in the same ecology. So why aren't they practicing polyandry is the question. Um, they are not, they are, not as well off as the Buddhist people. They have higher mortality, they have more stunting, more wasting, um, poor health outcomes across the board. Um, so they're definitely not doing as well, and probably in large part because the birth rate is way higher and the estates are way smaller. Because in polyandry, especially this kind of polyandry, fraternal, where the brother, the co-husbands are each other brother, each other's brothers, the estate is passed intact from one generation to the next to the next. See what I'm saying? Because it's not split up between separate marrying brothers every year. And I think that's why it's the ideal, because those families that, that do maintain polyandry over generations have the most resources, they have the most land under cultivation, generally speaking. So that's not a great, there's no answer, there's no, we don't really know, I guess, but those are some things we do know. You mentioned that a lot of the, the single women are in nunneries. Do they also stay in their uh, birth families and take yeah. care of the older? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what they do. And in this valley where I showed you the pictures and discussed tonight, they don't have any nunneries. So they kind of, hang out on the periphery of the monastery, the village, little village monastery, but they mostly live at home and look after their, their dads and uncles and their brothers eventually. So they're like, you know, laborers at home. And I looked at their fertility, because some of them do get pregnant, of course, that happens, these unmarried women. Um, and in the, the village that I spent the most of my time in, over, there was no surviving child of, a, of an unmarried woman in living memory. Children had been born, but they did not survive past age five. What factors play into that? It's hard to know. Um, I mean, Buddhist people don't kill other creatures, so I, I really doubt that any infanticide was practiced, although, you know, infanticide is common to historically certainly common in South Asia, is very well documented in India and Pakistan. Um, it, it really fundamentally goes against the um, precepts of um, obviously Buddhism, but you know, the way these people comport themselves. But having said that, my professor that I mentioned before, the honeybee <laughs> stealer, um, so she studied um, what happened to unwanted children, and she did find a pattern of passive neglect in, um, in, in particular households and particular kinds of families to particular kinds of children. So they would not be named, for instance, or they would be named something that was like, um, you know, would presage what was gonna happen. Um, or they would be um, poorly clothed in winter, or there was one case that she described where the child was put for nap, its nap beside um, like a big <clears throat> basin of water, like a big like a big bucket of water, and it's little child. So there's no culture of like a family taking taking those two people back in, or that's just doesn't happen. You know, I think it does, it happens. That is what happens. It, it may be half-hearted. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
And then there, in the neighboring valley, there is actually, uh, they're also very polyandrous. They are more strictly polyandrous than where I lived, but I, I worked with the people from that valley in winter in Kathmandu. And there, there were way more single women who, are, um, who had children. And so one of the development organizations that I work with in this district is solely focused on those children because their outcomes in life are so poor because they, don't, they cannot inherit land. Um, and if you don't have land in an agricultural society, you can imagine that you know, you're going to have a tough road to hoe. You'll have no road to hoe, actually. <laughs> that was the wrong saying. <laughs> so, any other questions? Let's thank Kimber again for her talk. I'd like to mention that next week, um, Dr. George Reese, uh, who is an infectious disease specialist at uh, St. Pat's Hospital and uh, was one of the first people sent by the CDC to West Africa in the outbreak of the Ebola crisis, um, he's going to be giving a talk, and uh, he's really an interesting guy. He's going to talk about polio, and he's going to talk about how, how polio is uh, almost completely eradicated now in Africa and how that occurred. A very interesting topic that he's really an expert on, so I hope to see all of you here next Wednesday night at the same time. Awesome. Thank you guys. Good night.